May I invite Mike Bradbury, Caregiver of the Year, to talk to us about what good care really looks like. Okay, <laughs> this isn't something that I do every day, talking to lots of people. So you have to forgive me if I uh, lose my way a little bit. Um, my name is Mike Bradbury. Um, I'm here today with my beautiful wife and uh, my managing director, Paul, who's brought us down. And I have uh, four kids back home. I say kids, they're ranging from 10 years old to 17, four, four, four children. And we live in Marple Bridge, near Stockport, so I work for the High Peak branch of Home Instead. So, when I left school, I became an apprentice joiner. I was working for a company for about two years, and it went bust, unfortunately. So, I rooted around and managed to find another job. I ended up working in exhibitions, so building exhibition stands, transporting them myself, two halls. In fact, I worked at the ICC here, the exhibition hall which you've just been in. I've worked, probably built five or six stands in there about 25 years ago. So you could say I've probably gone full circle in coming back here today. From there, I, I got married and um, I wanted to end sort of working away. So I uh, got a job as a bench hand joiner and was there for 12 years. And obviously that was a great thing because I was able to see the children grow up. Um, but how and why have I ended up coming into care? Well, I was introduced to one of my first clients, Joan, and it was a question that she would ask quite often, virtually every time I went round in the early days. Um, she suffered from dementia, but we, we used to speak a lot. We used to talk a lot in the, in the, first, in the early calls. And she would ask, why? why? Why have you come into this? Why are you doing this? And I would, I would tell her that uh, I needed a change of career. I wasn't getting any job satisfaction from what I was doing. And I didn't really feel wanted in that environment anymore. I also in, I knew that I enjoyed helping and talking to people. You certainly don't get much conversation out of a piece of wood. And my wife was wanting to go back full time after bringing the kids up and staying at home looking after them for God, that was <laughs> how many years it was. But um, so I fancied, you know, getting doing some part time work and being a house husband as well as changing career. And it was with the strength of my, my wife really that was I was able to do it. Uh, without her advice and support, it would have never have happened. Um, but also, what I never told Joan back in those days was that I was feeling depressed as well. I was having a tough time, and I'd actually gone into some dark places, and I, I really needed to get out. But uh, aside to that, my mum had, had developed Parkinson's disease, and that was going through um, at later stages. And I found myself round there and she needed personal care. So when I was round there, I would help her in any way that I could. And I felt that if I could do that for her, why couldn't I do that for anybody else? So I ended up getting a job with Paul. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. So recently I was asked, what does care look like from my point of view? So I wrote a few things down of what I, this is what I think. I enjoy the opportunity to make an effective difference to people's lives and help to protect their right to live safely at home for as long as possible. And when the opportunity arises, I dearly love to help my clients mobilize within the community in whichever ways they have become accustomed to throughout their lives. There are many people, senior citizens and younger, who need various types of care. So what Home Instead do is look at your attributes as a caregiver and match you up with the appropriate clients. Personally, I have given all aspects of care a go 
and enjoy the variety it brings to my working week. I believe there's some water here. So, a big part of what I do, as I've mentioned before, is with my mum, with the personal care, invo involving, as you'd imagine, you know, taking people for a shower, drying and dressing, toileting, shaving, you know, wet shaving, whatever it is they need, uh, and try and deliver that care in the most dignified way for them possible. And try to empower them as well, so when you, you're not just going in and taking over somebody's... Um, routine for washing you, you, you help with the shower but you'll pass them the flannel and they the, can wash the face themselves and you work as a team in in that environment and, and they do as much as you can as much as they can um yeah so one of my first calls was in fact going to a gentleman who who needed a bath and i was there for quite a long time there were long calls like six hour calls but he, on my first call there he said would you give me a bath and of course i was very nervous and and um, we went up to the bathroom and I gave him a bath and it went well. And afterwards he said, you know, Mike, he said, that was fantastic. I really appreciate what he did for me. And in fact, I do have quite a lot of carers going there through the week, but I'm going to wait for you. I'm going to wait for you. And when you're here, you're the, the person that's going to give me a bath. And you can imagine how much confidence that gave me. When you, when you start a career like this, you're looking for little bits of confidence along the way, you know, going from being a joiner to this. And, and I think of um, Ian today, he's not with us anymore, but when I'm in times of doubt, I always think about Ian and, and the confidence that he gave me, saying that, you know, he was going to wait for me. I've also worked with a gentleman in 24-hour care in a bed. And I work with some fantastic, again, it was early in my career, and I work with some fantastic people. All the care, in fact, all the carers I've ever worked with have been fantastic and great with me and very supportive in helping me. Knowing that I'd, I'd, I was my joinery, joinery background, there was a lady called Gail, who was a, an ex-nurse, and I'd like to thank her in particular for the, for the time she spent with me. And that has led to me now working with a gentleman who suffers from PSP, and if anyone's ever heard of it, PSP, but it's called, it's, it stands for Progressive Supranuclear Palsy, and it affects about three people in 100,000. So he's very, very unlucky. You know, that's, that's worldwide. Um, and he's very unlucky to have that. And it's very debilitating. It's a little bit like motor neurons disease, if you don't know. If you know what that is, then you'll understand what PSP is. But it tends to be a lot quicker, PSP. This gentleman needs hoisting. Um, he can't move any of his limbs anymore, or very little movement. And his eyes are locked. And so I, I now go in on my own and we'll, we'll hoist into the shower, give him a wet shave, something that he really enjoys, a wet shave, is something um, that I take a lot of pride in doing. Obviously, being hands-on as a joiner, it's nice to do something, you know, like that. And emotional support is another, th another big part of my week. Um, so, I've, I've just, just leading into that, I've just written something, and it goes like this. Uh, technology plays a huge part in care like the care call system with the red button pendant that my mum uses and most of my clients wear. You've got stair lifts, uh, mattresses that help prevent bed sores. And the gentleman that I go to um, uses a hearing aid device around his neck that links in to his hearing aids so he can hear the telly through it. Very clever, amazing when, when I saw that. And uh, glasses that control computers, you know, when, when you lose your abilities to work that computer with your hands, you can use your glasses. So very clever stuff. However, we all need that human touch. A person who will listen to our feelings as we open up our hearts and release what we've been keeping to ourselves. In the knowledge that the person listening will be confidential. And when we lose that special person, maybe our wife or husband that can't be replaced, who can we turn to? Is there somebody out there that, that could have the compassion and empathy to help fill that unbearable void? And I think that Home Instead do that. And all the carers I've met, they all do that. Now, a lady that I went to, that one of my first calls that I went to, and I mentioned her before, Joan, 
her husband had died and he'd got to 100. And her lounge was a sh like a shrine to him. Every there was a photograph of Albert, wherever you could possibly imagine. There was even a card from the Queen to commemorate his 100th birthday, but he'd passed away. And she said to me on many occasions, I just wish you could have met him. You'd have loved him. And I said to Joan, when I'm not on this planet anymore, and when you're not on this planet anymore, we'll be in heaven. And when we're in heaven, I want you to introduce me to Albert, and we'll sit there, and we'll have a cup of tea. And she found this very comforting. As Joan's dementia is, is now in the advanced stages, she's, she's now in, in a care home. And all the stories that she's told me over the years, she's forgotten. But I can relate those stories back to her now. So I sit at her bedside and do that to this day. And at the end of every, every call I go, I get down on my knees and hold her hand at the side of the bed. And we say the Lord's Prayer. Now I'm a Catholic and she's C of E. And we share that same prayer. And Joan says it word for word every time. She doesn't really know much anymore about her life and what's happened in the past. She knows my faith. She doesn't quite know my name every time. But she knows the Lord's Prayer. And the power of prayer that I've witnessed in that moment is bigger than any, that anything I've ever come across. And all the times I've been to church, I've never felt power like that. There's also a lady I visit, Yvonne, and again, it's a very emotional call. In essence, it is, it is a tea call. And she was married for 65 years, but she lost her husband on, on Christmas Day last year. And she, soon after that, she lost her sister, who was like a mother to her. But I go round, and sometimes I walk through the door, and she's very, very low. And I sit on the floor, so I'm below her eye level, and I listen to everything she's got to say. And that could be for half an hour, it could be 40 minutes sometimes, even though it's only an hour call, so we'll fit everything else in quickly at the end. Um, lost my lines here now. So I will then offer some words of some comfort as best I can, and try and turn that negative into a positive with uplifting memories. So we'll still be talking about a husband, but going back to the start, where they met, the day they got married, and that, that lifts her. And then we can, then all of a sudden we're laughing and joking. And by the time I leave that house, if she's laughing and joking with me as I'm walking out the door, I've done my job. And I think 95%, well, 99% of the time, that's the case. So that's emotional support. Home help, we, we obviously do a lot of that. Uh, worked with a younger man, actually, he's in his, in his 60s, Steve, and he had a stroke. But he's the most inspirational person I've ever met, I think. He, he was a rock climber, so it was a, it was a terrible blow for him to have the stroke and lose, lose all use in his left arm. Um, but now he's, he's walking the Wainwrights up in, in the Lake District, and he's doing it over two years. He's done 107. He's got 107 to go. So this time next year he'll be finished. And he's doing it all on his own. But when I go around, it's just a case of, you know, maybe washing his walking gear, you know, hand washing it and getting him ready for his next outing. Um, just anything I can help him with. I just thought it was a good example. Dementia care, as I've, met, I've talked about already. We're not, it's not just in the home. We do go into care homes as well. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. So I, I met Peter a couple of years ago and he was in a home. He's extremely anxious and we used to just go out and have walks to cafes, which he dearly loved. Um, over that time, he spoke to me about his cycling days in the Peak District. But sadly, over time, his ability to walk diminished. So I decided to incorporate my car. He could walk to the car. So we'd take him in the car. And luckily, nearby, there was a hill. 
uh, Werner Flow, which he, he, kn he knew Werner Flow. Peter suffered with dementia, obviously, but he, knew, he could remember Werner Flow. So we'd go up Werner Flow. And in fact, when I used to go to see him, he'd ask, he'd ask can we go up to Werner Flow? Can we go round and go up to the top and sit up there? So I used to go up and park my car facing the Peak District. And I could point everything out to Peter that he could see. And, and he, re he dearly loved that. Um, and in fact, um, I said, in the distance, Peter, you can see the, top, the, the highest mountain there, Kinder Scout. And on the other side of, he said, yeah, yeah, Kinder Scout, yeah, I can see it. I said, on the other side is Castleton. And he said, Castleton, I can't really, I can't place it. I, I know the name, but I can't place it. I said, well, if you're on your bike, Peter, and you, you're going down Glossop Road, and you're just over there, and you come into Glossop, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm on it, yeah. I said, you go up. Um, the snake pass, yeah, the snake pass, and then we drop down the other side through the through the forest, yeah. And then he'd say, past the pub, yeah, past the pub, the snake, the snake in, yeah. And then we drop down and we turn right across the bridge, yeah, I'm with you. Go across the bridge, come to Bamford, turn right again through the Hope Valley, through Hope itself, and then we're in. And he would say, Castleton. We've arrived in Castleton, a place that he couldn't he couldn't get there in his mind. He, he couldn't get there, but we got there. And he would then carry on from there with the route, you know, for, for as far as he could remember. But I felt that that was a, a person-centred approach to care. I found out what Peter loved, and he was able to achieve it. Even though we couldn't cycle it anymore, we could do it in, in his mind. And it wasn't until after he passed away that I spoke to his daughter. Um, and there would, there'd been a little bit of conflict, you know, between... Uh, the, within the family, some people wanted him. To, she wanted him to stay at home and have care at home, but most of most of the rest of the family wanted him to go into a care home. And if he, she hadn't called home instead, she found out about home instead, and they said, "Yeah, we can help you. We can help you, Dad." And for two days a week for two years, we went into that care home and we changed uh, changed his life. <laughs> And I know that because I used to speak to the care, care home staff and they said he was a different person when he came back, completely. Also in the home, with uh, dementia care, I've worked with a gentleman um, who loved painting. So he's, we, I'd go round and his wife had bought some uh, paints and we'd, we'd do that. I'd do a bit of painting, pass the brush to him, he'd do a little bit and so forth until we finished the painting. A few weeks later, uh, I went in, and to my my, shock, my surprise, they'd had the, the painting uh, mounted uh, in, in a frame and hung on the wall. And he was so proud of it, you know. He was, and then and now we've probably got half a dozen of those paintings that we've done uh, all around the place. And and he absolutely loves it. He's so proud of what he's achieved. He also liked to read poetry. Um, one day I went in and he'd got some poetry books out. I've never read poetry in my life. But I thought, right, well, so I read a poem and passed the book to, to, to John, and then he read a poem, and then I read a poem, and he read a poem. Again, he, he absolutely loved that sort of thing. So all the care that we do, obviously, medical support, making sure people have got the correct doses at the right times, documenting it all, whether it's tablets, liquids, paracetamol, even oxygen, you know, making sure people have got their oxygen mask on uh, for the right times. And being a friend, I don't know if the picture's there, but um, just being a friend and companionship is another big part of what we do. Uh, I've got, there's a gentleman that I go to, he's 97, and we go out twice a week and we'll walk with the wheelchair, he'll walk it as far as he can and we'll get into the wheelchair and then he'll, I'll push for a bit and then he'll get back out and walk and... It's, it's a great thing. And then when we come home, I'll help him with his iPad, because we you were mentioning that before about technology. Um, for a 97-year-old man to be working an iPad is quite incredible, and it's lovely to, to assist him, just with some basic, basic stuff. OK, so just to finish... Uh, regarding Home Instead, I've always wanted to work with people who inspire me. I've found that. It helps me to, to give my best when the people above me are leading by example. 
A lady I visit recently told me that my managing director, Paul Vickers, filled in for a caregiver that couldn't make her call. He took her to hospital, stayed with her throughout, then brought her home and made dinner. She speaks very highly of Paul and Christine, my manager. In fact, all the staff that I work with. So just to finish on, when I decided to change my, care, uh, to change my job, I came across some negativity and stigma which I feel is based on ignorance regarding the caregiving profession. Well, I'm here to tell everyone that it's simply not the case. Since joining Home Instead, I have loved every day and I'm delighted I made the change in career. I don't get that Sunday night feeling of impending doom anymore, which I used to feel when I was in my previous profession. I feel the love I give to my clients is reciprocated. This unexpected side of the job I couldn't have anticipated when I first started. And it gives me a sense of fulfillment and well-being I've never felt in the workplace before. In this job, it's true. The more you give, the more you get. Thank you.